we're going to have some fun today exploring one of the region's lesser known neighborhoods, that of Lincoln Acres, an unincorporated community wholly surrounded by National City, which is south of San Diego proper. Lincoln Acres has a population of only 2,100 residents, not counting their horses and roosters and chickens that they're allowed to have there. It was settled during the Great Depression around 1930, mostly by farmers living the Midwest. These settlers recognized the importance of a library in their small community, and it became one of their first public buildings. They built the permanent library in 1945. Adjacent to the library was a well-used but hidden community park. Well, as you can imagine, 70 years of constant use took a toll on the facilities, and so Lincoln Acres Library and Park were re-envisioned and rebuilt in 2013. Allow me to introduce Anne Militante, a Lincoln Acres native, architecture student, and San Diego Architectural Foundation board member. She's here to help us connect to the library of old, re-envisioned. Let's listen now as she recalls the small library she frequented as a young girl. Actually, I grew up right around the corner, so only a few houses away, and we would go to the old library all the time. I remember the adults in particular would hang out there and chat, and it was definitely a place for people to um, get the news from each other and talk about neighborhood issues, but it was also it was very small. Um, so as a child, I would have loved to spend more time in there just picking books and looking at books and making piles and sit around reading, but it, it just really didn't have the space for that. It was very cramped, very small, and I always felt like I needed to hurry up and pick something and get out of the way. That sounded charming. Let's bring in architect Ricardo Rabinas of the San Diego firm of Softy Rabinas Architects to help us understand how and what inspired his firm to design such a wonderful building. But the biggest excitement was when we got into the library and um, we felt like it was a hidden treasure. There was a lot of um, interesting books. It's like going to grandparents' houses, all couches, all carpets, but all very nice and neat and warm. And you can see that in every single corner of this library, there was that sort of feeling, very informal. And as you're walking around it, even though it was a small, you will find somebody else in the corner sitting, uh, pulling some magazines and other ones in chairs. You know, I'm curious about the community park adjacent to the old library. What was it like? The park at that time was behind the library so if you were coming in off the street, you would see the library and some other buildings and the park was kind of hidden behind that. Um, it wasn't really a, a welcoming type of park. We did go there, we knew it was the neighborhood park, but it was almost like some kind of insider secret that you had to go through this narrow entryway and get in there and couldn't see the street from it. And every afternoon to evening before it got dark, then one of the neighbors across the street had the key and would come kick us out and lock the gate. And that was that you had to find somewhere else to go. Well, Ricardo, how did the park play into your design? We knew there was a park. We opened the gate and we look into, and actually from far away, we saw there was a, a tree and then we find this beautiful pepper tree inside the property which was part of the park and the park was not very friendly park but it was a park it needs more pieces it's not green actually it was dirt but the tree was there um, outstanding with a lot of history because it just feels very old the trunk was very big and it was like an old lady really sitting there and um, between the charm of the library the warm and the history of the tree uh, and seeing the side we basically that gave us the clue of what should we do how do we tell the story of this place and the tree became this old book who knows the history of everything so it has to be kept and preserved and built around it and the library became an entry to the park because the park didn't have an entry so we create an arcade that bring from the streets all the way to the heart of the park. And through that arcade, you visit the library and you visit the community center and also small police stations and the bathrooms. 
So that was very simple, but we felt that all those three components will make a new story and it will be the narrative of the beginning of um, new identity in a way for Lincoln Acres. I love the way Ricardo describes the architectural solution as listening to the story that the old building told and finding its new narrative. Also, he considered the tree, the park, and the library together in their solution. They created that arcade as entrance from the street to both the park and the library. And wherever you are in the new facility, you see the tree. And so it's for these reasons we've selected this view of the building for our sketch today. It has the front of the building as a simple elevation, the arcade is a simple one point perspective, and of course the tree. I'll show you some tricks for sketching convincing trees. Let me start with a quick overlay to give you an idea of what we're doing today. We'll start our sketch with some simple lines. We'll have an angled line for the roof, some for the windows, the ground, and then a big circle for the tree. And that's the gist of our sketch. There's some angled lines that show the arcade and the walkway. It kind of draws your eye into that center area. So that's it. That's what we'll be drawing today. We'll start working in pencil. I'd like you to keep your lines light and your arm loose and try not to choke your pencil. Let's start by drawing that front column and place it in the middle of your page. Now let's add a, a line that indicates the bottom of the wall where it meets the ground. It will be helpful to find the right edge of our drawing. So visually, let's compare the height of this column to the width of the from the column to the edge of the view window. It looks like it's about one and a half lengths. So let's measure the height of that column with our pencil, turn it sideways, tick off one and a half lengths. Now make a vertical line. Let's add that sloped beam on top of the column. Or you can eyeball the angle, but that easier way is to hold your pencil up against the photo at the same slant as the beam. Then, without turning your wrist, lay that against your sheet. That's your angle. Lightly pencil that in. Notice that the beam has a slight cant or angle at the bottom of it. You'll want to make sure you get that part. It's, it's important in the design. We'll add a few more lines. One above it is the top of the beam, and the next above it is the edge of the roof overhang, and finally, the top of the roof overhang. We'll add a line just to the right of that first column that represents the corner of the building itself. Add another one, which is the edge of that window. Now a horizontal line about two thirds of the way up. That'll be the top of that orange wall and is also the bottom of those upper windows. Add a couple more lines to divide those windows into the pieces that we see. I'm taking a look at my drawing and I don't know, it looks to me like I've got that edge of that window not far enough away from the column. The proportions just weren't right. So I took my kneaded eraser and I'm gonna erase that line and scoot it over a little bit to the right. Doesn't that look better? That's why we work in pencil in this first stage because we're gonna make some mistakes. Let's look again at our photo. Using our pencil to find the angle, I want to see the angle of that upper roof and I'm just drawing a line over the photo and I'm, I'm finding that angle from the bottom of the columns and where those two diagonal lines come together, that's our vanishing point. And where our vanishing point is, is our eye level line. Let's do it for our drawing. Find the angle, compare it to the photo. Now lightly draw that line on your drawing. Do the same for the bottom of those columns, which is where the, that walkway is. And you see where those two diagonal lines are crossing? That's the vanishing point. Horizontal from there, that's your eye level line. I'm adding another diagonal line starting from the vanishing point. That's the other side of that walkway that's coming out toward us. Let's draw a few more details in that front elevation. Doing a horizontal line near the bottom of the wall, 
that's the sill of the window. Let's block out the tree next. It'll be helpful to have the other edge of our drawing, so use your pencil as a marker. We know that the column is right about the center of our drawing, so measure from the right-hand side of the drawing to the column, and then make a mark over on the left to get the left-hand edge of your drawing. Looking at our photo, we can see that, the, that we're trying to find the trunk of the tree or the center of the trunk of the tree. Looks like it's about halfway between the column and the edge of our drawing, so I'll make a little vertical line. We're going to find that the tree, the top of the tree where all the foliage is, it's like a big circle. So draw that circle. And notice where the edge of the circular form is compared to, say, the column, where the middle of that circle is compared to the edge of the roof looks like the edge of that roof is pointing right to the center of our circle. Looks like the bottom of the tree lines up kind of with the edge of the orange wall. So lightly sketch it out. I do keep looking back and forth from my, my sketch to the photo and to get the proportions right compared to the size of the building itself. And then let's block out like a little rectangular form that's the trunk of the tree. We can see that the bottom of the tree kind of aligns with um, the sill of the window. There's a little wall, a concrete wall underneath the tree. I think I'm going to draw in that, that book depository that's in the front there. Okay, so the trunk of the tree, we want to start sketching loosely where the branches go. Look carefully at your photo. Tree branches oftentimes are like Y's with lots of arms. The other interesting thing about the tree is it's, it's kind of like a big pom-pom, or it's made up of a series of smaller pom-poms. So, so I'm making some loose sort of oval -y shapes. Just looking at the tree, I, I see a whole series of ovals, and I'm just lightly sketching them in. Now let's sketch those columns along the walkway. Ricardo calls this the arcade and is the entrance to the heart of the project. We're seeing it in perspective. The front of the building we drew is in elevation, meaning it's all series of rectangles or straight lines. But when something is in perspective, it means that things that are closer to us appear larger and things that are farther away appear smaller. So those front columns are going to be larger and then as they get farther away, they're gonna get smaller. I'm gonna show you this great trick of how to get them spaced so that they visually look correct. We need to find the end of that row of columns. If you look at your photo, you'll see there's a little rectangle way at the end of that, that arcade. So draw a little horizontal line just under the window lines there where until it hits that diagonal. Where it hits the diagonal of the roof, bring a line straight down. Where that vertical line hits the diagonal of the sidewalk, make another horizontal line. Now I'm drawing a line from the top of that, that leading column all the way back to that vanishing point. Now we find our back column, our, our shortest column of all. That's where that vertical line of that rectangle, we extend it up till it hits the diagonal. And now we have our shortest column and our longest column drawn in. These two horizontal lines that I'm drawing right now are um, part of the roof in the back. I just want to clean it up a little. And maybe I've decided I'd like that last column a little farther back. So I've drawn an extra little line. So you get your diagonal for the top of the columns and the diagonal where the bottom of the columns are hitting the sidewalk. I'm showing this again. We've created a trapezoid, like a triangle with the nose cut off. The arcade has 17 columns, and they all fit in that trapezoid. And since this is a sketch and meant to be fast and loose, you can just make a series of vertical lines that are the columns, and your sketch will be convincing enough. But if you'll hang in with me, I'm going to show you a really cool trick that'll make your columns equally spaced and will be a little more convincing. Let's make an X through the trapezoid. I'm starting at that far lower corner, connecting the front upper corner, doing the same with the other side. 
Now draw a vertical line through the center of that X. I know this is tricky, so I'm going to repeat that one more time. But trust me, it's going to be worth it. So let me tell you what you just drew. There are 17 columns in that arcade, and there are 16 spaces between the columns. When you drew that X through the trapezoid and made the center line and created two shapes, well, the front shape contains the first eight columns and the back shape contains the remaining eight columns. Crazy, right? But that's perspective. Objects closer to you appear larger and those farther away appear smaller. We're going to divide that front area in half again and make a vertical line. Then we're going to do the same for that back area. Make an X through it and a vertical line. Now you've got four divided spaces. And each one of those spaces has got four columns in it because you had 16 columns, you had 17, but let's just say 16 columns, four spaces, each of the spaces has four columns. It'll be easy to eyeball from here. And now that I've shown you the trick, you can divide up the colonnade the way I've shown you, or as I first suggested, draw a series of vertical lines to approximate the spacing, and then, as my husband would say, declare victory. So how'd you do? Do you need a little more time with those columns or shall we move on? This is after all the pencil outline portion and we'll come back with the inking. I'm just adding some random lines here um, to help me uh, find the ground plane. Um, and I also draw in random lines when I'm, I'm thinking about my next step. I'm adding the upper edge of our drawing. It'll help when we go to ink in the tree. I'm starting to lightly draw in some of the details, the siding on the building, and um, I add the name. See where it says Lincoln Acres Library? I'm, I want to just give a hint to it. I don't really want to write the, the letters in specifically. That would draw too much attention to that area. So I'm leaving a trace of where they are, and we'll ink them in, but we'll want to make it light. The palm tree is next. I'm saying the palm tree is optional because you get to decide what's in your sketch. And if you want to emphasize the building, just leave the palm tree out. Since we're just blocking out the palm tree, I'm going to draw a tall rectangle that represents the bottom of the palm and then another rectangle above it that will have more texture in it when we go to ink it. And then for the palm frond area, I draw something that looks like a quarter of a circle a bit of a blob. It'll get more details later when we start to ink it in. I'm adding some of the details in the foreground, the sidewalk, some lines that indicate the driveway. The things in the foreground are going to be bigger because they're closer to us, so we want to be careful about what we add. Because if whatever we put in the foreground, it's going to want some attention. So I like to keep things a little bit vague. Now we're going to ink over our, our pencil lines. And with whatever pen you'd like to use, I like to use sort of a thin one. But the thicker pen, the thicker the pen, um, the more sort of fun character or looseness you'll get in your sketch. When sketching, we usually start with lines and then move on to shapes, followed by the details and finish with the shade and shadow. So in the inking, I'm, I'm starting with the building and its lines, and then I'll move on to the shapes, which mean we'll be moving on to the tree. I promise to show you how to make a tree convincing without drawing every leaf. Notice here I'm drawing the lines of the building, but I'm working around the palm tree which I'll ink in later, that is if I decide to. You get to choose what you include, so even though we've penciled in the palm tree, I guess it depends on our mood when we get to that point. 
It could also depend on how much time we have left to finish our sketch. I like to try to finish my sketches all in one sitting. They seem a little fresher that way. I'm adding some lines um, at the edge of the roof and uh, sometimes I'll break these lines up. Sometimes I'll make them solid just depending on how um, how how much emphasis I want that edge to have. I'm drawing the eave line now. You see how I'm sort of breaking it up? When I get in between the columns, I don't want it to be a continuous line because you don't see it as a continuous line. You'll see the columns in the way. I'm inking in the columns now. Can you see how they get closer together and smaller the farther away they are? If you followed those steps of dividing the trapezoid, you can ink in over your lines, your pencil lines. Otherwise, eyeball the columns, making them smaller and closer there in the back. I'll continue to fill in these lines. Try, notice that I'm going to I'm getting darker the farther back I go. As you know, things get closer together the farther away they are, and the spacing between the columns get closer together too. And that's why things get darker. I'm inking in that, that book depository, adding a few extra lines. What I'm really doing is working my way from right to left, uh, working up to drawing the tree next. I'm drawing in that little concrete curb wall that's underneath the tree, starting as a, a, a base for our tree. We start with the trunk of the tree, as we did with the pencil sketch, working our way up, getting lighter and looser with our lines. When sketching trees, it helps to remain loose and playful, actually, especially with the leaves. Now let's talk about sketching foliage. Different trees have different shaped leaves. This is a pepper tree, and the leaves are narrow and droopy. We'll use a series of scribbles, actually, to define the leaves. You want your scribbles to be both regular and irregular. What does that mean? Well, they don't want to look too uniform, so vary your scribbles to be some bigger and some smaller loops. Working from the outside first, define the perimeter, but break up the edges, meaning you don't want a complete circle of scribbles. You want some here, some there, and work your way around where you've had your pencil lines. I usually make the scribbles on top of the tree loop up, and as I work toward the bottom, the scribbles aim down, like the leaves themselves. Remember, we talked about making some forms with our pencil, like pom-poms. So do your scribbles around each of those pom-poms that you sketched in. I recommend sketching the tree as a whole and fill it in gradually rather than starting in one area and making it too complete. Stay loose. I just keep going, working around these areas. I think I'd mentioned that the top of the curved forms, the, the little squirrely, squiggly leaves point up, but when I'm at the underside of the curved forms, my leaves point down. My little squiggly lines are pointing down. There will be areas of shadow that you will want to make darker. Work up to those. The shadow areas will be between your roundish shapes and on the opposite side of the light. You'll have more lines on the shadow side of the tree and keep your fewest and maybe longest lines for the sunny side of the tree. I'm making some shaded areas here. The lines are longer, kind of like cross hatching. 
Loosen up on the pin a little to make these. That way the lines have a little character. Now I'm starting to shade the tree branches. Don't worry about getting too dark in these areas. The punch will add some impact and character. Notice that the shadows are a series of curved lines to show that the branches are curved. I'm trying to keep the spacing of these curved lines irregular. So I'll put some close together and some farther apart. But I definitely want to get them closer together, the, the closer up into the tree we get. Remember to keep uh, looking at the at your subject, at your photo, or if this were in real life, looking at the actual tree and comparing where are the light areas, where are the dark areas, which areas of my sketch could benefit from uh, more attention. And there is a little bit of a disconnect between your sketch and real life because your sketch is your interpretation of what you're seeing with your eyes, not a, not an exact replication, just a, a gesture in, in general. This is what I see. The roof is casting a shadow on this area of the tree, so I'm making those long curved lines to show that darker shadow area. Continue to keep adding leaves, details, shade shadow. Sometimes you'll get into a zone. This is where sketching is fun, relaxing. It's also, I think, when you get into that zone, what makes looking at your drawings several weeks later so interesting. Sometimes you'll remember drawing every line, and other times you'll look back and say, gosh, did I do that sketch? When I'm on vacation or doing any kind of urban sketching, Looking at those sketches weeks, months, years later bring back really fun memories. I can remember exactly where I was sitting when I was doing the sketch. In this case, I, you know, ideally we'd be in real life and you'd remember the tree. You'd probably hear the kids playing in the park, the people coming and going from the library. It'll bring back lots of memories. You also want to keep in mind uh, as you're looking at your sketch, deciding that important point when I've drawn enough, I've drawn enough leaves, I've drawn enough shadow. It's very subjective. Maybe better to underdraw than overdraw, especially if you're working in ink because you can't take the ink off. And if you do get one area darker than you want, it's it's you haven't ruined your drawing. It just means you probably need to bring some of the other areas. Uh, up to that level of detail. It'd be fun for you to draw other trees that you see, comparing different ways of drawing leaves. They can be straight spiky lines if, if you're drawing a pine tree. Um, uh, a lot of ficus trees look like lollipops and they're very dense, you don't see much through. Or try to draw a willow tree where you see a lot of sky through it. Um, or what's also fun is find a tree in wintertime, a deciduous tree in the wintertime when the leaves are off and you're just drawing the branches. Those can be very dramatic. The tree looks pretty good, I think. So 
Now let's start drawing some of the um, other details. Some of the things we might see in the playground, that, that chain link fence that's in the background, the border of the drawing, just to give us focus. I've decided to crop off some of the bottom of the drawing. I'm, I'm not being true to the photo. I just don't want to draw that stuff. I don't think the sidewalk and the and the front street is all that interesting. Now I'm putting a little definition in on that cyclone fence in the back, that chain link fence. Be very careful about drawing in something that's in the background like that and adding texture to it because you don't want it to, to take over your drawing. So I'm using some a really light flick of my of my wrist or my fingers just to draw in some diagonals that just hint at chain link. I'm adding some horizontal lines under the tree. That's the shadow of the tree. It's not a very big shadow because of the position of the sun. So it's just some lines uh, in that area that's um, being cast by the building and cast by the tree. I'm adding a little shadow on that that little concrete curb wall. I make my my hatch lines vertical because it's a vertical surface. Horizontal surfaces, you see I'm doing the horizontal surface there with a horizontal line. I've been saying the palm tree is optional because you get to decide what is in your sketch. And if you want to emphasize the building, maybe leave the palm tree out. The palm trees can be fun to draw, especially when you learn a few tricks. Let's start with the trunk. See how there's a smooth or relatively smooth portion in the lower half? It's smooth, especially compared to that upper half of the trunk. And uh, the rough portion above it, that upper portion is where they've cut off the old palm fronds. And there are a few spiky things that look like a collar or a necklace, and we're going to add those. We want to add some cross hatching in this upper area to suggest texture. The sun is there on the right, so you'll add your shadows on the left. We've been working our way up from the ground, adding texture to the, the trunk of the tree, adding curved lines and hash lines. The curved lines help to make the tree trunk look round, and the hash lines help the tree trunk look textured. For the palm fronds themselves, see that most of them are visible from their sides. We don't see the open fan of the palm frond. So those are going to be like wedges, not half circles. Looks like there are five of them. So let's make five wedges with lines in them. Palm fronds often have feathery ends that hang down. Try sketching those with a flick of your pen using light pressure. Notice how much darker are the insides of the fronds, like the inside of a fan. You can hit those with extra strokes of your pen.
Let's add a few more details. Let's ink in those letters uh, that say Lincoln Acres Library, but I encourage you to keep it light and sketchy. As I'd mentioned before, we don't want them to take over. Well, I mean, I guess if you, you could make them really bold if that's where you want people's size to go. I'd like to make the name of the building just a suggestion. I'm adding in those spiky plants in the foreground. As always, you get to decide if they go in, but I like that they help the composition and they add a little character. As we did with the tree, keeping lines loose and playful are really helpful when it comes to drawing vegetation. I'm adding the siding now. Notice I'm using dashed and broken lines because those lines are subtle. When working in ink, any solid line will have importance. So to soften the line or to downplay the importance of a material, use the dashed line and very light pressure. Adding shadows to the arcade is an important step. It will help draw your eye to that area and give depth to your drawing. When you're drawing shadows on the ground or, to sh or on a sidewalk, there, make your lines horizontal. That helps the eye to read those, that space as a ground or a walkway. Notice we get darker when we get farther back. That helps create depth in the arcade. We want to add shadow to the underside of the roof in that arcade as well. Add shadow with lines that follow the angle of the roof. Again, getting darker the farther back you get. The same rules of shadowing apply to those outer eaves and will change the angle a third time to follow the slope of those rafter tails. Again, getting darker the farther back we go. A nice touch will be to add shadow between the columns up there near the tops because you can actually see the roof overhang and eaves through the columns. We'll do the same thing at the bottom of the columns in a moment. It's fun to add one or two sort of careless lines on the walkway in the front. They suggest those cracked, uh, cracked lines in the sidewalk you aren't supposed to step on. I say careless lines because we want a looseness and a sketchiness to them so that they're sort of playful, like the leaves on the trees. I've also been adding a few more shadow lines on the ground. These are horizontal lines just to help give that area some punch.
Now is a good time to erase any remaining pencil lines and see where we are. Those pencil markings can deceive us into thinking we've inked something when we really haven't. It's also a good time to take a look at the drawing and, and see if there's anything uh, that, that's remaining to be done. As promised, let's add some shadow between those columns in the lower portions of the arcade. As before, keep lighter near, near the foreground and get darker as you go back to help give depth. That arcade is starting to look very convincing, don't you think? I'm adding some hints of grass in the foreground and some, some loose horizontal lines. Again, I just use a flick of my, I guess I'm using a flick of my wrist to, to um, make the grass. I start at the, at the ground and just sort of flick up and make a little angle of it. Looks like blades of grass. You don't need very many, many of them to be convincing though. Maybe a few extra lines in and, and shadows in the driveway. You may have noticed throughout the sketch, I'll, I'll add a little extra line or a little extra shade in one area and hop over to another area. It's, it's building the whole drawing up together. I mean, we've started with lines and then to shapes and then details and shade and shadow. And then at some point, it's a little bit of back and forth and back and forth, almost like, I don't know, seasoning a dish. Um, you don't want to add all of your seasonings right at the beginning. You might taste it as you go along and add what you think you need. We're about ready to add reflection on those windows, so my eyes going over to that area. I draw in a few more lines in and around the windows uh, to fill in the window frames, and then let's add a little shadow under the edge of the roof at the rake, just to get the tonal values correct. Reflections may seem a little tricky, but they're easy, really. Sometimes windows look very dark, or they reflect the sky and look like they're all light. Or you see right through them and there's nothing there at all. I like to use diagonal lines to suggest glass, and I'll use some of our darkest darks for these areas. The diagonal pattern is a bit random. You can make your diagonals go left to right or right to left, which is, whichever is easier. Sketch in lightly anything that you can see through the window, especially if it hints at the space beyond. In this case, is, it, is there anything that suggests it's a library? Are there bookshelves or books that you can see through the window? As a final touch, I'll add reflections of the power power lines that, that we, we can't see them in the photo, but we can see them reflected in the window. I'm adding a couple of lines to show the parking spaces. Maybe some loose lines in the parking lot too. But what about that upper right sky area? As I'm looking up in that area, I'm thinking that maybe our palm tree could 
could use a little more definition. So I'm just going to hit it with a little bit more, more black to uh, in the middle of the palm fronds, just to just to give it a little more punch. Let's add some lines that might hint at clouds or atmospheric conditions. I'll make three looping casual lines, very quick and loose, definitely working from your elbow here. Then add some M's, some lowercase M's. They're to look like little birds. 